Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hope you've all had a great week. I've just heard the cracking news from the SEC that Bitcoin and ETH have been deemed not to be a security, which is great news. I think we're, well, I don't think we're all happy about it, actually. I've noticed a few people on crypto Twitter, a few personalities have got upset about this. I've got absolutely no idea why. I think the SEC regs are anti-freedom, which kind of feels anti-crypto. Um, so I've got no idea why they're upset unless... They're a bit sad that they didn't buy ETH at $5 or they were short in ETH hoping that the SEC would deem it a security. But yeah, I think it's ridiculous. I think this is only good for crypto. So I am very happy about this and let's hope it triggers a reversal in this crappy downtrend we appear to have been in all year. So onto this week's interview, it's an absolutely fascinating one. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I met up with Jill Carson in London and had an hour with her to discuss a whole bunch of things about crypto and blockchain. And, and it was really cool because I've, I've actually wanted to talk to Jill for quite a while. I read an article on Medium that she'd written quite a while ago, all about something called short convexity, which I won't even pretend to explain or that I fully understand. But in there, there was quite a bit of content relating to the risks faced by securities. And it kind of sparked some thoughts in my head and some concerns. And from that, then I went to her blog and I read every single article she's written. And I will share this out in the show notes. I recommend going and reading it. Uh, Jill's got so much knowledge and she's got a really good practical way of looking at the market, which I don't think many people are doing. So yeah, please go and read them. Um, and also, it's quite funny, you know, when you do these interviews, you're trying to maintain a flow, you're trying to maintain a question structure, but keep the interview flowing and still listen to the person. But not always are you having the opportunity to fully digest the content because of trying to maintain, you know, a quality interview. So sometimes it's only when you listen back afterwards, like I do every week when I'm preparing the show notes that you actually get to fully digest the interview. And, and I didn't realise at the time how good this one was. And I'm not saying that it's good because of me. I mean, because of how good uh, Jill is and the great answer she gives. So, yeah, I actually think this is probably one of the best interviews I've had. So, yeah, I, I hope you enjoy it. It's um, lots of really good practical financial experience and advice from Jill and thoughts on the crypto space. And, you know, it's no surprise that she's in such demand now she's freelancing. Uh, in other news, I mentioned it last week, I'm busy working on my own crypto project, something called open paper which is on the website www.openpaper.io very early on i am building a collaborative project for discussing and reviewing white papers because i never read them i've said this before i think the only one i've read is satoshi's actually um, but i don't read them i don't have the time and, and you know quite often the content's really complicated and it's not something i have the technical experience or skills to understand so i wanted to build a project where people could upload white papers discuss them comment on them live and yeah we'll have this uh, a test and mvp version hopefully out in a couple of weeks it's a centralized project i'm not building it on the blockchain i'm using a traditional database uh, but hopefully it will be something that will be really useful for other people so if you're interested go to www.openpaper.io and register for beta access um, and also quite interestingly actually I'm, I'm thinking about how i fund this you know right now i can fund it but long term i'm not sure that's viable and ironically i won't be producing a white paper because i don't think it needs it i will be doing a traditional 10 slide pitch deck explaining what the problem is and how i'm solving it so if you'd like a copy of that i'm happy to send you one uh, just email me on my email address which is hello at what bitcoin did.com outside of this guess what I'm going to say? Same as every week. Please support the show. If you skip over this and you don't, then you're missing out on the chance of helping me. And if you enjoy the show, enjoy the content, this is the one thing you can do back for me. So please do head over to iTunes and leave me a review. Hopefully you like the show enough to give it a five-star review. And those reviews are important because what they do is help with my show coming up in the search results when people search for Bitcoin. So yes, if you can, if you don't mind taking a couple of minutes, I would hugely appreciate that. Also, feel free to follow me on social media and get in touch. I respond to pretty much everyone. I am on Twitter, Medium, Instagram, Steam, pretty much everything. And my handle on every single site is at what Bitcoin did. And also check out my website. It's www.whatbitcoindid.com. You can sign up to my newsletter and I write content and put out articles there. And also feel free to share this episode out with your friends. Lots of you do it and I really appreciate it. It helps spread the reach and it helps spread the podcast out to new audiences. So yeah, please support the show. Right. 
As ever, I've probably talked too much. I seem to do this every week. I apologize for that. Um, but now onto the interview with Jill. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I hope you get out of it what I did. I hope it makes you think a lot. There's a lot to digest in this interview. So yes, I do hope you enjoy it. And if you've got any questions about it, please reach out to me. I do reply to everyone. As I said earlier, my email is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And yeah, it'd be great to hear from you. Enjoy the show. Hi, Jill. Hi, Peter. Good to be here. Yeah, welcome, welcome to London. We're uh, sharing a mic here because <laughs> I seem to have broken one of my travels. Um, so you were at Consensus last week. I was indeed amidst the madness. And what, what did you make of it? Well, the conference itself was an absolute mess in my judgment. Um, I spent about two hours just sort of walking the floors, checking out the booths, taking in the scene. And I'll be honest, it was difficult to walk away from that experience feeling very good about a lot that's going on in the space. What what was it that was uh, worrying you? I felt like, have, have you seen the movie The Big Short? Yep. So there's that scene in The Big Short where they walk into the mortgage conference in 2006, right? And mm. it's it's set in Las Vegas and there's just sort of crazy hype around the market. And there's the guy standing up on stage saying that, you know, the mortgage remains the bedrock of the American economy and the market is going to continue going higher and higher. And it just sort of felt like that level of peak bubble hype insanity to me. Was there anything you did see, though, that you did find that was promising? Yeah, so that was the conference itself. Uh, I I would say that what was really good about it, though, about the whole week, was that it did bring together a lot of the, you know, people who were doing a lot of the really hard work building in the space, you know, a lot of the sort of meetups that happened after the conference or on the side around the conference uh, were really positive, and that was a nice reminder that, you know, progress is being made. There are people who are there for more than just the Lambos. Yeah, there was, wasn't there a bunch parked outside? There were, see, yeah. I didn't, I didn't see them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, there was a whole crew of Lambos that rolled up every, every day, sort of mid-morning, that I think was just more of a meme than anything else. I can't imagine that was being done in all seriousness. But it was a nice contrast between that and... There was also this scene of protesters outside that I think was just being put on by uh, cryptography or, you know, maybe one of the other artists in the space of people, um, you know, sort of mock bank- bankers uh, protesting against Bitcoin cryptocurrency, which was hilarious and, and also a nice juxtaposition with all of the Lambos parked outside. So... I read every word of your blog. I mean, I'd read one of your articles before, um, which I mentioned before we started, but I've now been through and read every word of every blog article you've written. And I'm not sure that's recommended. <laughs> no, it's good, Mostly actually. just rants. Well, no, but... actually, it's pretty good. And I, and I read, um, there's a couple on your Medium, which you haven't put on your blog. Um, but so I've read, read it all, and I thought it'd be really interesting to meet with you and talk with you because you've got a really interesting way of looking at the past, but also therefore look into the future. So I've got a whole bunch of questions, but for context, um, you've just quit your job, right, recently? Uh, a while ago. Oh, was it actually. a while ago? Yeah, I've been freelancing for the last six, nine months. Oh, right. I thought it yeah. was, sorry, I thought it was, um, sorry, I, I dissociated My the article. My LinkedIn may, might be out of date. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it, that's maybe what it is. Um, so can you, for context, talk about your, your previous roles at Goldman Sachs, right? Yeah. Then your role at Chain, yeah. and then now you've gone freelance, just so people know who you are, what your background is and therefore, and then what you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. So I started out my career as a bond trader at Goldman. Uh, I was trading emerging markets debt and derivatives. So specifically, I was trading the sovereign debt and uh, credit default swaps of countries like Argentina, Venezuela, um, you know, some really basket case economies and uh, governmental systems going on. Uh, especially at the time, I was on the desk when Argentina defaulted back in 2014, 15. Uh, I was on the desk when Hugo Chavez died and, uh, you know, in Venezuela, obviously. And it was through that lens that I was first really introduced to Bitcoin, actually. Um, 
a broker friend of mine who was based in Argentina called me up one day in about 2013 and said, Jill, you've got to check out this Bitcoin thing. I've just managed to get money offshore for the first time in a decade. Uh, and that really struck me as, okay, there's a real use case here for this stuff. Um, so I started to get curious about it back then. Never in a million years would have thought that I would wind up working full time on Bitcoin or, or in the space of cryptocurrency. In fact, it was kind of a running joke on the desk at the time. So I was spending so much time researching it, trading it around a bit, you know, trying to figure out how the hell to buy and custody this thing. This was even sort of before Coinbase was mainstream. Um, and there was a running joke on the desk that, oh, Jill is going to be the partner on the desk of, uh, cryptocurrency trading at Goldman Sachs one day. Of course, back then that was preposterous. And a handful of my friends at Goldman have reached out to me over the last few months saying, hey, you know, now we're spinning up a cryptocurrency trading desk. So funny to see how things come full circle. Um, I left Goldman a few years back to go pursue an advanced degree in economics, political economics. Uh, at the time, I was going to school to study what I thought was going to be a pretty mainstream topic of sovereign debt sustainability, this sort of you know, dry uh, topic in econo economics. Uh, by the time I got to university, though, by the time I got to this master's degree, I was sort of fully down the crypto rabbit hole. Um, went into my supervisor the first day and said, you know, I'd really actually rather study uh, the impact of this thing, Bitcoin, on financial markets and regulation, what's going to happen here. I got a lot of raised eyebrows, as you can imagine, but when studied that anyway, wrote, wrote a dissertation on it. And coming out of that, worked at Chain. Uh, Chain is a startup based in the Bay Area, uh, focused on enterprise blockchain. So that fit well with sort of the combination of cryptocurrency and Wall Street background. Um, left that last summer, so going on nine months or a year ago now, uh, to start working with a bunch of friends I had in the space who were starting sort of a variety of startups um, and launching cryptocurrencies, launching ICOs, uh, the first of which was Tezos. Uh, so worked with Kathleen and Arthur a bit on that. And from there, kind of expanded the portfolio to have done some work with uh, the likes of ZeroX, DYDX, a lot around decentralized exchange. Uh, I've done a bit of work with CoinList and a handful of other organizations. And what, what kind of work are you doing for these guys? So just sort of generically at a very high level, uh, anything business or operations related. Um, so with decentralized exchanges, one of the huge uh, challenges that that space is facing is just how to bootstrap liquidity. So trying to strategize around that, it's a very tough problem. Um, with some of the ICO projects I've worked with, it's been a lot more around how to structure things from an operational or corporate governance sort of perspective. Um, so as we were mentioning earlier before we kicked off, I've done a decent amount of thought, uh, thinking rather around how these types of projects can and should be structured and what that looks like, not just over the short term, but over the very long term. You know, it's a complete paradigm shift from what we'd normally think of as a startup that's aiming to be cash flow positive and profitable. Uh, you know, these are, you're usually dealing with two to three entities for a given project. You know, there's usually no sort of revenue model, et cetera. Right, and that's some, something you've written about, um, specifically with regards to how these uh, companies are managing cash flow in terms of tokens. What, what, what is your fear with this? Yeah, so exactly. My fear is that these companies, these projects, are going to run into a situation down the line where they're eating away at the resources they have. And even if today it seems like, okay, they're eating away at it, but at such a pace that, you know, they'll never catch up with the growth of their treasuries because they're inevitably sitting on a bunch of crypto assets, whether it's their own tokens, whether it's the Ethereum or Bitcoin they've raised and, you know, everything's gone parabolic, 
or at least until the last few months. Um, you know, that's just not really responsible risk management. And also, you're ultimately going to run into a cash flow issue. You know, if I, if I were to throw my hands up and say, right, I'm just not going to worry about my own income, let's say, I'm not going to worry about generating more and more, you know, cash flow for myself as an individual ever again. But I have all of these investments that I've made and I'm just going to sit on those investments and hope that, you know, over time they appreciate at a faster rate than what I'm spending on, you know, living my own life. And presumably that spending is going to go up over time. Um, I'm going to run into an issue probably eventually, uh, you know, markets correct, markets crash, and you just don't want that much correlated risk in your portfolio. Do you see, so one of the things I struggle with is the difference between enterprise value and token value. In that, in enterprise value, there's a traditional P&L, there's a traditional target to be cash flow positive after a certain amount of time, or if not, refinance as long as you're on the right trajectory. With a token-based economy, it's, it seems a bit different, and I can't picture how that works. Is that something you've looked into? Yeah, so one of the things, one of the funny things to consider about fundraising via a token is, and you know, I'm certainly not the first one to say this, but you're basically executing your seed round and your IPO at the same time. Now, usually when companies IPO, you know, it's because they've reached some sort of an escape velocity in terms of their growth, in terms of, you know, having a proven revenue model, uh, if not profitability. Um, and generally, they're not so worried about having to do another fundraise, at least in the short term. Now, what you find with token projects, however, is when you're conflating that seed round and the IPO at the same time, I mean, there, there's a reason why early stage startups don't just go out and IPO, right? It's because there's a lot of uncertainty. It's because things aren't proven yet. They don't know how much funding they'll need down the line. But if you've, you've made this promise to your investors that this is it, basically, you know, you're not going to issue some other dilutive funding round uh, and massively damage that investor base that you have, uh, or you know, perhaps not investor base, donor base, as the case may be in token land, then you know, suddenly you've backed yourself into a corner and that's sort of all you get. Um, and I think that that could also prove very problematic. So it's like one, one shot. You've got one shot. It, it feels like it oftentimes, yeah. yeah. And you know, maybe that one shot has yielded you, you know, $50 million or hundreds of millions of dollars. But again, if you take a step back and you look at the amount of funding that most startups raise over time, you know, there's this sense amongst people right now that, oh, $50 million, well, you know, that will give us runway ad infinitum. That's just not the case. No, I mean, I, I guess eventually, I, I guess the, the lesson from traditional fundraising is there is a reason to have a seed round and a series A and a series B. And also with these uh, tokens-based economies and token-based businesses, I feel like without venture funding, they're almost missing a layer of advice and support that they would get that comes along with the venture funding. Whereas people invest in the tokens don't really have any influence over what the business is doing. That's what keeps me in business. Uh, no, but in all seriousness, I think that's absolutely true. I think that something that a lot of, especially the earlier projects, you know, now most of the time you see sort of a pre-sale happen or some sort of equity round happen that does include some of these very seasoned angel investors or else even, you know, the big major VC funds that, that does provide that advice and that support that you mentioned. But I think especially amongst the projects that were sort of first to market with this model, that's something that was massively discounted. And I would argue wrongly so, because the fact is, is that as much as, you know, everyone, at least in Silicon Valley, loves to kind of hate on the VC model, unless you are a venture capitalist, of course, uh, it exists for a reason, just like this, the classic seed series A, series B, so on, uh, structure exists for a reason. 
And I think that that speaks to a much larger trend, actually, in cryptocurrency, which is that, you know, people who have come into crypto, they love to sort of reinvent things that have for a very long time been in existence. I was just having a conversation the other day with absolutely brilliant young entrepreneur who's uh, creating some very kind of convoluted but very interesting I think, um, structures using state channels. And at the end of this sort of five, 10 minute long conversation, I just sort of scratched my head and said, oh, so escrow, we've created escrow accounts. And he was sort of like, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right, actually. (laughs) It's just sort of like, okay, you know, that's, this is absolutely an interesting new experiment and you know, perhaps changes some of the fundamental ways that we might think about these concepts. But, you know, there's no need to sort of go back and reinvent the wheel on everything. Some Sometimes some of these uh, financial concepts or else just best practices in business, they exist for a reason. And maybe we shouldn't throw out things like raising equity rounds, uh, you know, turning to VCs for advice, support, and all of the other value add that they have. Uh, and there's no need to reinvent kind of the textbook on, you know, things like revenue model and business model, et cetera. I think one thing that uh, I found interesting when reading one of your articles is that, and I hadn't really thought about it, but a number of these, uh, let's call them utility tokens, have a native token, and you question why why don't they just use ETH or Bitcoin? I thought that was kind of interesting because actually, if they use ETH or Bitcoin, they're essentially just replacing the dollar bill or the pound with a universal monetary token that sits globally, but actually it feels a bit more like they would treat it as an income and then have almost like a P&L just based on crypto, whereas with a native token, I, can't, I don't see the model working the same. Yeah, so I'm glad you asked about the native token. My thinking on this has actually changed pretty substantially over time, but I'll walk you back through it. When... Specifically, and I don't mean to call them out because I actually think that the project in many ways is brilliant, but specifically when Filecoin came along and they were sort of the first example in my mind that I at least really took notice of, of being the so-called utility token, something that's having utility within their network, within the technology that they're shipping. Um, When that came along, I sort of thought, oh, this is just, really silly. You know, this is just conflating their fundraising, their equity round with, you know, okay, maybe something that they need within the network. But in reality, I would much rather just use the ETH that's already in my wallet than than a file coin. They're really only just using this model in order to, A, be able to fundraise at the time and B, in many ways, not actually have to worry about revenue or so they think, because they'll be sitting on all these file coins that are going to appreciate in value, so on and so forth. We've been over this. Um, I still maintain that that's true for a lot of these utility tokens, meaning that there isn't sort of a really compelling reason to have that exist as opposed to you know, just using ETH or Bitcoin or something that was pre-existing. Um, it's a bit like I moved into a new apartment building a few weeks ago and in that apartment building, kill me, there's sort of communal washer dryer that I have to go in and put quarters into. And guess what? For the first three weeks that I lived in that building, I didn't have any quarters lying around. Who has spare change anymore? Who uses fiat anymore? Am I right? (laughs) <laughs> I've, actually, I've actually got a quarter on me. Oh, this guy does. A US quarter. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, I was in a shop earlier and I tried to, look, look. I tried to pay, I tried to pay with it. I, oh, you're go. kidding. I tried to oh, pay and I, I thought it was a 10 PP, so then they gave it back to me. This guy's got the dirty Fiat on him. You can, you but, can keep that for your washing. <laughs> Perfect. Point being, I didn't do washing for three weeks because I didn't have quarters. And I tend to think that for many of these utility tokens, the story is going to be the same, where it's just added friction to the user experience. No one wants it. No one wants to be having to change 
whatever it is they're already using into another token that they're going to have to go on Poloniex or Binance or so on uh, to access. So that's sort of been my baseline thinking around utility tokens all along. As of late, it's evolved a bit. And the evolution of it is not that now I suddenly think, oh, utility tokens actually have some native utility. It's more just like, well, shit, now we have all of these things. They're probably not going to go away. Everyone has seemed to buy, well, everyone who's building in the space seems to have bought into this idea of, oh, yeah, utility tokens are fine. Everyone's So now my thinking is more around, right, how can we make it such that these utility tokens can be seamlessly you know, transferred from one to another, or exchanged one to another without adding friction to the UX. And that's a big part actually of what has gotten me really excited about decentralized exchange mm -hmm. is because with something like 0x, there's the possibility that I can you know, go into IPFS and purchase some file storage using file coins without even ever really knowing that they've changed from ETH to file coins. And I think that that is, if we have to live in this world where utility tokens are a thing, I think that that is probably the most compelling vision of how it ends up looking. It's also, so I started reading more about atomic swaps and I kind of had two questions about it. I mean, the first one is, uh, it seems to me like uh, atomic swaps are give you the ability to not need to hold all these different tokens and that you can just hold Bitcoin or just hold ETH and therefore you, with atomic swaps, at the time of requiring a Filecoin, you could just do an atomic swap, which kind of made sense to me and I thought that saves this hassle of jumping between exchanges and holding multiple currencies. But then at the same time, I was thinking, well, and I put it out on Twitter and I still haven't seen a compelling argument, but it seems like therefore atomic swaps almost devalue everything apart from the top, two or three coins at the top of the food chain because what is the reason to hold them then? Well, so this is actually where I start to think that the token model might be interesting from the perspective of just inventing a new sort of asset class where the reason for holding them is merely because you think that the network is going to continue to gain value over time and it's, it's a means of exposure to it. Mm. Now... I still struggle with that a bit because there's no way to really fundamentally value them today. You know, it's not like the case of equity where there's this sort of contractual arrangement where you own a bit of the network. You don't own a bit of the network. You own a bit of the asset that's moving around in the network. You know, with increased usage, whatever, should that asset necessarily go up in value? Not necessarily. It starts to get into questions of, velocity and so on that, you know, Chris Berniski and others have, have written a lot on. But we've yet to see any of that really proven out. So I remain a bit of a utility token skeptic. I do like this vision of, right, if we have to live in this utility token world, then, you know, something like 0x or atomic swap models or whatever, we'll just abstract it all away because I frankly don't really want to have to deal with anything else besides Bitcoin and maybe ETH if I have to. But you don't own any ETH, right? Uh, you'll note I took that off of my Twitter handle actually yesterday. <laughs> I, I think that we've hit something of a local minimum in it, but we shall see. I, I hate making price predictions out loud, so that's, that's as close as I'll come to one. So, so back to that point in utility tokens, the way I try to picture in my head to simplify it is that it was almost like uh, buying up a bunch of tickets to Disney and standing outside Disney each day and if enough people come, you could sell them at a profit because the demand's there. But if there's not enough people coming who want to come to Disney, you're going to have to start selling these tickets at a loss. And my fear is that in planning ahead, the token supply for many of these projects is, is huge. And once these projects start actually delivering uh, services, the velocity is not going to exist for day one. Or it might have a spike on day one, but the reality is I think the, the market will probably drop for all of these coins and there's a potential a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money. I mean, that's absolutely a possibility. I think, well, I think there are two things here and it's important to distinguish velocity, uh, which is, you know, this notion in economics of basically 
the rate at which money supply moves around an ecosystem or, or market, and then liquidity. And I think that they're both important considerations as we try and sort of make predictions about how these utility tokens will behave. The one that I actually worry more about is liquidity. Um, this issue of, you know, let's say we live in this world where, you know, something like decentralized exchange, it's abstracted everything away on the back end. Well, okay, fine. You know, we're living in this world where we think of things as disintermediated and therefore there aren't third-party rent-seeking intermediaries and so on. Well, but you're still having to exchange those tokens. You know, I'm still having to buy the file coins, even if it's abstracted away from me. I'm still having to buy those file coins from someone on this back end. And likely that's a dedicated professional market maker, right? And there's nothing really you can do about that. And that market maker is going to be charging some kind of liquidity spread. And so, you know, is it this case where we've, you know, actually just replaced the old boss with the new boss and it's really, you know, the same thing here. Uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, right? That's the quote. Um, you know, there's still some sort of rent seeking going on. It's just that we've displaced it from third-party coordinating intermediaries that we see and we're kind of clear on we've uh, substituted in these market makers that are just going to sit on the back end of these systems. And you know the other thing is actually of all the uh, different things, uh, different categories of uh, crypto and blockchain projects, I actually find the utility tokens probably the least interesting in that I understand filed coin, it sounds interesting, but really what is it that's going to take me from Dropbox to that? You know, is there going to be a significant difference in price and the same user experience? Okay, maybe. Or possibly I see a niche use case for people who who are worried about the uh, files they're storing, they want it decentralized. I actually find, there's a couple of things I find a little bit more interesting. I feel, I feel like cryptocurrencies themselves as a monetary unit are a lot more interesting. Um, I've read part of your article about Venezuela. I interviewed, do you know Alejandro Macedo? Yeah, well, I know him on Twitter. Right. <laughs> so I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago. It's not out yet. And we had a long conversation about Venezuela. And he was telling me, even with the dip from 20 to 6, 20K to 6K, if you held Bitcoin, you still had more Bolivia at the end of the month. So I found, find that really interesting because it's an actual use case. And I find, <laughs> ironically... A lot of the things that Anthony Pomp talks about interesting, even though he inspired your article. So I find a lot <laughs> thanks, of things. Pomp. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Pomp. I find a lot of the things to do with um, to, uh, asset tokenization. I, I interviewed um, Trevor from Polymath uh, about that. And again, I find that really interesting because uh, it's a real use case. With everything you know and your experience and your background, what are what are the things that excite you most, and the things you think are, uh, there are actual use cases, and, and the things you think people are going to use? Yeah, so I absolutely think that today it comes down to, it still comes down to this censorship-resistant, tamper-resistant form of money. Um, you know, like I said, the, the way that I first understood cryptocurrency was through this lens of hyperinflationary emerging markets or emerging markets where there are very stringent capital controls in place. Um, and that's where I still see a lot of the utility and the value in these things is in places like Venezuela, um, where, you know, at this point it's almost kind of descended into a state of, you know, Mad Max like anarchy, right? Um, and, you know, I've spoken to people who've told me that it's devolved into almost a barter economy, right? Where, you know, people will bring their, bananas or, you know, whatever it is that they have on hand to the marketplace and exchange it for goods and services, because that is just more efficient than using the boulevard, using the national currency. And, you know, it's like, if there is anywhere where cryptocurrency makes sense, it's surely an environment like that. And I think that the thing that's really transformative about all of it, and, you know, this is the thing that I sort of had to remind myself of as I was walking away from 
the madness of consensus. And frankly, that I have to remind myself of every few weeks is, you know, I receive whatever ICO pitch that just makes no sense. But I just keep coming back to this idea that for the first time in, you know, at least since, you know, the peace of Westphalia or whatever, we have sort of the modern nation states. For the first time, there is no longer a monopoly on, you know, the creation of value or monetary systems. That's really what Bitcoin did. It's a great quote. <laughs> okay, so let, let's delve into that. So, so with Bitcoin then, obviously there's a specific use case with, you know, basket case countries like Venezuela, but do you see a wider use case? For now, I think that the wider use case remains this digital gold, digital store of value, which I know a lot of people love to sort of say, oh, well, you know, how big of a deal is that really? You know, how many people do you know who store gold bars in their basement? Well, firstly, they wouldn't tell you about it if they did in all likelihood. But I I do think that that is a much bigger deal than people give credit to. Often when I say this to people, especially people who are just getting into the space and really excited about it, they sort of raise their eyebrows at me and they say, well, you know, if that's it, then why, why are you devoting your career to this? Why are you so excited about it? But I do think that, that is a really, really big deal in ways that, you know, people who want to see this vision of the whole like decentralized web, so on and so forth, tend to dismiss. And why though? Why is it such a big deal? Well, again, I think it comes back to this idea that there is no longer a monopoly on the creation of money and value. Um, And specifically, there is no longer a government monopoly on that. Um, You know, suddenly there's this globally acceptable and globally transferable unit of value that I don't need a vault to store, that I don't need to trust an institution or a bank to store, um, and that I don't need to be, at least in theory, I don't need to be a member of sort of the you know upper class or upper echelons of society to have access to. Um, now, have we seen any of that really come to fruition yet? I don't think so. Um, I think that there's a lot of work to be done in order to make it actually be used in these ways. But, you know, I look at things um, like innovation and custody, and I think I think that, you know, that's a, a good step in the right direction. Or I look at work that, you know, a company like BitPesa is doing, and I think that that's a massive step in the right direction as well. Do, do you believe it has to be used to spend to, to give it the value? Do we need to have the flow? Because what... what I, I struggle to understand something that as a store of wealth, if it isn't also some form of medium exchange. I know at the moment, it, can, it along with Ethereum, provides liquidity to most of the crypto market. But if there's no ability to spend it on something, I struggle to see it maintaining value. And I know, I, I understand it's just you know, psychological. Yeah, I mean, there I think that the right comparison is to commodities markets, right? You know, gold, especially the precious metals. Um, you know, how many people do you see going around sort of, you know, trying to buy a coffee with, you know, ducats of gold or what have you. And yet that obviously is still endowed with value by the markets. But a massive amount of that is also speculation. So I think today that's the right comparison. Now, I think that down the line, I think that as Bitcoin becomes more viable to be spent on sort of day-to-day goods, I think that the case for value becomes stronger and stronger. And I think developments with the Lightning Network and so on are going to be really critical to see that come to fruition. Do you, uh, are you a Bitcoin maximalist with this or do you, are there any other monetary tokens you like? Do you know what? Everyone I meet all of a sudden wants to tell me that they're a Bitcoin maximalist it's suddenly become this in vogue thing to, to go around saying, oh, yes, I'm Bitcoin maximalist. <laughs> There's someone, I think it's uh, Chris Bernisky is running a Twitter poll right now, says, are you a Bitcoin maximalist? For the record, I answered no, because I think that very, very few people are Bitcoin maximalists in 
the sort of traditional sense. But it was something like 45% yes response that. to Bitcoin maximalist. And uh, I posted this sort of funny meme a few weeks ago about, you know. Is that the four brains? Yeah, it's the four brains. And the sort of normal brain is like Bitcoin. And then, you know, the semi-galaxy brain is, oh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then suddenly the galaxy brain is like, oh, all of these altcoins, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Dash, Monero, Zcash, so on. But then the like ultra galaxy brain is Bitcoin again. And I feel like everyone who came into the market in the past year has suddenly come around throughout this crash and said, oh, maybe Bitcoin is really like the only one with value. And and a lot of the really sensible people in this market seem to be these quote unquote Bitcoin maximalists. So I'm going to be one too. Nothing wrong with that. For the record, I think that Bitcoin still today has the most sort of proven out value. Um, I think that one really underestimated thing about Bitcoin is its governance model. To me, one of the big takeaways from the, at least for now, resolution to the scaling debate, if you can call it a resolution, was that the model works, that the governance model works. If you want to revolt, go ahead and fork. We'll see how successful that is. Otherwise, yeah, you have to, you know, it's a dogfight to get anything implemented into the Bitcoin core code base. And that's, that's exactly as it should be. You know, your money shouldn't be uh, trivially upgradable, nor should there be, you know, one forceful individual or institution in charge of what those upgrades are. So that's the reason why I've been most consistently impressed um, with with Bitcoin and the community around it. That said, I, again, you know, would not tout myself as necessarily a Bitcoin maximalist. I think that there are a lot of other projects out there that offer a lot of value. Um, I think that the privacy coins, Monero and Zcash, are great examples of that. Um, I think that, you know, some of the work that's being done in the Ethereum community is... Yeah, absolutely incredible. And I'm really excited to see where that goes. Uh, I think that a lot of these other platforms that are coming to market, these smart contracting platforms, uh, have a lot to offer as well. Um, So jury's out. But for now, I would absolutely maintain that Bitcoin has proven itself out the most of any of them. I think that means actually beyond just being quite funny, is actually quite interesting because I think it reflects the journey you go on with crypto and that you usually discover Bitcoin and then you discover all these other things that you think are great, possibly a little bit biased because you make a bit of money on them and then you kind of come full circle. But I, d- I don't think it should be binary, Bitcoin maximalist or everything. I think what happens is you're, you, you get a broad vision and then it kind of narrows and you realize actually there's only a few genuine use cases. So I, I would never be a Bitcoin maximalist and I love Monero. I think Monero is great. I don't see a need for Zcash. Um, I see potential needs for Litecoin as a backup when Bitcoin is busy, but I just starting to see like a, a narrower use case. And also if you're investing in most of these long term, Will they hold value long term, you know, compared to Bitcoin? So, you know, I understand that. Um, let's talk about stable coins. Oh, good. <laughs> because you've talked about stable coins. Uh, I don't get them unless it's pegged. To me, there's no such thing as a stable coin because a stable coin is volatile or stable depending on what it's peg- pegged to. Yeah. So, it's um, the only case I truly understand is pegged to a specific currency. I don't understand any other. So can you tell me your thoughts on stable coins? What yeah, am I missing? So, so for the sake of argument here, we'll define a stable coin as a coin that's attempting to be pegged roughly one-to-one with the US dollar. Let's just, let's just start there because that's what in practice most of them are doing. I know most of them also have roadmaps to move to some kind of like global CPI, the economists, like Big Mac index, whatever it is. Even if you're a stable coin trying to pick yourself one-to-one to the US dollar, I have problems with that. And again, you know, you have to remember before I sort of kick off on this rant here <laughs> that, you know, I came into this through the lens of having traded <coughs> sovereign debt of Venezuela and Argentina, where 
you know, it, <laughs> let's just say that any attempt at stability uh, by their central banks in, in their monetary policy dramatically failed. Um, and what you wound up with was, you know, black markets and so on. Now, there are basically three different models for attempt at stable coins, as I see it today. There's, let's call it the tether model, where ostensibly you have you know, a bank account somewhere and there are exactly backed one-to-one -one the number of dollars in the bank account with the number of crypto assets floating around in the crypto market. Uh, the second model you have is, call it the basis model, which is you know, basically you have some kind of algorithmic monetary policy in place that's adjusting the amount of supply based on the fluctuations in the amount of demand in the network. Um, so you've got the tether model, you've got the basis model, and the third model is the make or die model, which is uh, basically an over collateralization of other crypto assets in order to create something that's sort of pegged one to one. The problem that I have with stable coins, regardless of the model, is that even just the name of them, the branding around them, and the promises that most of the teams around them are making feel a bit dishonest to me. Because the reality is, is that all of these things are compelling. All of these things serve a use case. I think Tether, above all, proves that out, that you know people are still willing to use this thing that is near universally considered questionable, <laughs> at least. Um, and, you know, people want that convenience of having something that they can trade in and out of, uh, that they can use to take profits within the ecosystem, that they can, you know, use to buy things on the dark web or what have you without exposure to Bitcoin or Ethereum, although I think that use case still has yet to sort of come to fruition. Um, but they all tout themselves to be, yeah, stable and in some sense maybe efficient as well, when in reality these things will break down under some black swan event circumstances. Uh, now, you know, the extremity of those circumstances might be up for debate, but I at least think that none of them should ever be really trading one-to-one -one with the U.S. dollar because there has to be some kind of discount mm -hmm. rate there. You tweeted this out, right? I did, yeah. And, you know, the, the responses that I get to this argument, I think, are valid in the sense that, well, if you take into account the convenience that these things offer, maybe that balances out whatever the discount rate should be. That's fine, maybe, if you really buy into, you know, this thing serves a utility in this market, and therefore, you know, if a normal discount rate would bring it down to 90 cents on the dollar, that, you know, 10 cents on the dollar gets added back in because it's, it's serving this utility. I don't buy that. I don't think that these things are really serving a utility to the market that can't be provided by other more compelling, more viable crypto assets out there. Such as? Well, even something like Litecoin, if you're worried about the use case of moving between exchanges, right, which is, you know, one major use case of Tether and other stable coins. Um, and, you know, there you still get some volatility, of course, but you don't have to worry about, you know, fees as you do with something like Bitcoin. Um, you don't have to worry about over-collateralization, you know, Maker, I think, is probably the most compelling of any of the stable coins because to me it seems like it's the most honest of them all just in terms of the limitations of it and what it offers. But it's hugely capital inefficient right now. Um, and you also don't have to worry about, you know, in the case of Tether or even really I would argue basis, you know, these things breaking down either because... Uh, you know, what has been promised is there, is not actually there, it's not actually collateralized, um, or because, well, hey, it turns out maybe this thing isn't actually stable. My perspective on it as a trader is, look, if, 
if the unknowns are at least known to me, then I can discount that and I can price that in. What scares me are the unknown unknowns, <laughs> which I would say that all of all of these uh, proposed stable points have massive amounts of unknown unknowns to me. And I think that that's the way that they should be viewed by the market as well. So one interesting use case for stable coins that I, I thought existed out, outside of um, exchange when people want to come in and out of crypto assets is when I looked at Polymath and I met with Trevor, I had a play with the platform and you can raise, uh, you can raise uh, money in ETH or in Poly in their token. And my worry for them with that is that you're going to, you're trying to uh, tokenize assets, so you're potentially trying to have funds bring their funds within to your platform, which makes total sense on an, in a number of ways. But these funds are going to be, they're not going to be reported in crypto, they're going to be reported in dollar. If they raise 50 million, if they target, say, raise 50 million in ETH, and that takes a week, and during the process there's a crash and they lose 20%, they've suddenly lost. 10 million. So for me, it kind of made sense to have a stable coin in that scenario because they're able to use the technology, they're able to access the liquidity of crypto, yet they are they don't have the risk of a, dev- a currency falling in fa- value dramatically during the raise. Can you understand that? Yeah, no, that, that does make sense. And to be honest, I haven't looked deeply into Polymath. I haven't played with the platform. It sounds, to be honest, like I would have probably five to 10 other issues with it, perhaps even just from a regulatory perspective. Um, but again, I, I haven't actually looked into it myself, but I I think that that makes sense to me in terms of, you know, as you're going through fundraise, you don't want to necessarily be exposed to these big fluctuations in the market. Um, I think that that's, you know, to go back to our earlier conversation, an issue that token projects across the board would do well to consider as they're thinking about the makeup of their treasury as it is, because it's not just during the fundraise. A lot of these token projects are still sitting on, in many cases, mostly ETH, if that's what they've raised in. And, you know, there I would encourage them not to diversify into a stable coin, but just to diversify into, you know, the U.S. dollar itself or other, you know, fixed income assets that most normal treasuries would have exposure to. Yeah, I think uh, Ari Paul, I, I, maybe it's him, maybe it's somebody else, who said that at, at least 50% should be converted back into USD. Oh, at least, because you think about it, you know, you have this massively correlated exposure where if your project is hugely successful, then in all likelihood the larger crypto market has also been hugely successful, you know, which way the causation goes there, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But, it, you know, in that scenario, you're least likely to be really worried about the funds that you have in your bank account. And in all likelihood, they've gone up, you know, 3x, 5x, 10x, whatever it is. In the event, however, that your project is failing disastrously, Well, that might in part be because the crypto market has also taken a dive. And in that case, when you're most worried about having funds and runway, then, you know, you might find yourself with half or less of the funds that you initially raised. Are you finding the people that you speak to from institutional side and traditional investors uh, are you finding they're ha- having a struggle understanding this space and, and getting involved? And is there also any fears with um, it's, it's going to fundamentally change their model over the next five to 10 years? I think there definitely is that fear that it will fundamentally change the model. And you definitely do see this sort of game of catch up going on of, hang on, we've got to figure out this space. What worries me the most, however, is when I see otherwise very smart, sensible people just suddenly throw all of their assumptions out the window because cryptocurrency is somehow involved. And I feel like I see this all the time where people will start down the path of, well, hang on a second. Okay, you're telling me if I invest in these things, then I'm getting these things called tokens, or maybe I'm not even getting the tokens, I'm getting a promise for future tokens. 
for technology that doesn't even exist yet. And there's no contractual agreement in place. There's no fiduciary responsibility going on. There, you know, there's no cash flow on these things. There's no revenue. And they start to go down this path. And then they just throw it all out the window and say, well, I must be missing something here. I just don't understand. I'm the problem, not the market. And every time I see this happening, I just want to grab these people and shake them and be like, no, 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 you're asking really good questions. No one over here really knows what's going on or what they're doing. We, you know, we all have hypotheses. To be clear, I'm overall, I'm bullish. Like, I think that things are going to shake themselves out. But what we need is more skepticism and more people asking these sensible questions that might make them feel like they're just too old school to understand the market. Um, and, you know, what, what really worries me is when people don't, feel sort of empowered to come to the table with those questions. And when I see people within the crypto space, you know, sort of throwing stones at that sort of skepticism, you know, it's, it's all well and good to shout hodl to the moon, but you know, we also need progress. Well, I almost think we need a couple of significant fuck ups, like uh, maybe a project to go live that just completely fails and nobody uses it. Something which is possibly, well, maybe even Tezos got us close to it. But, um, you know, just a couple of significant fuck-ups to wake people up and go, hold on. Because at the moment, everything's a future promise. They're almost debt tokens for a future promise that yeah. we don't know what's going to happen with. Yeah. It's almost like if we have a couple of fuck-ups, that's going to get everyone a bit more realistic. And and Because it was only when everyone got burnt during the first round of dot-com things got a bit more sensible and things have gradually got more sensible it wasn't like it wasn't like uh, all those silicon valley guys on the santa road their investment structure they didn't just come up with that in the 90s it's it's been an evolution right yeah no i think that's absolutely fair i i guess my question then is how big do the fuck-ups have to be i mean i look at things like you know not to call it out i think about like the parody wallet you know multi-sig disaster i think about um, Do you find some that's... of the OPSEC issues even that teams have had that are should just be so fundamental? You know, again, not to call them out, but like the Enigma team where, you know, there's just a very basic OPSEC issue that went on with their crowd sale. And it seems like because the market is still, you know, at, at prices that people wouldn't have even been able to imagine last year at this time, or at least certainly I couldn't have, you know, people are still willing to just sort of write these things off as, oh, yeah, you know, we, we put our hand on the stove, we, we got a bit burned, but let's just keep trying it again. The, the parity thing, I just find just unbelievable. You know, we're talking about hundreds of, was it 150 million something or something? Like that. Com- it was frozen. Comically bad. Just gone. Yeah. And I, you know, I, you speak to people, they talk about Ethereum being the future of programmable money. And I just, I struggle to see how large financial institutions will risk putting um, uh, significant amounts of their business in smart contracts, you know, because if if a million can get frozen, a hundred million can get frozen, a billion can get frozen. I just, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I, I think, you know, to play devil's advocate a bit on this, because I, I can get into this sort of cycle of being very negative about everything that's going on. We I should think, do some positive stuff. Yeah, I, I do think about, you know, some of the nonsense that, even I witnessed myself go on on Wall Street of, you know, the sums of money that amount to, you know, the, the same kind of caliber that we're talking about in the parody wallet disaster. Also, you know, no one can account for, you know, somehow gotten lost or disappeared in some way because the back office systems were broken because, you know, traders are completely irresponsible at times um, because of other forms of, you know, fraud or, or bad actors on Wall Street, what have you. I think of, you know, what's gone on at Wells Fargo with their accounts. Hmm. I think about, you know, the LIBOR fixing scandal. I think about basically all of 2008, 2009. I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> degrees of magnitude, orders of magnitude, different Wall Street, you know, is still perhaps worse in many ways. But I also think about something else, which is that having worked on Wall Street post-2008, 
there was definitely this sense that nothing we were doing was a game. It was all real life. There were always people on the other side of the trade from you. Uh, there were always regulators watching. And then downstream from all of it, there were always, you know, the common sort of mom and pop investors in whatever mutual fund or pension fund or what have you. And everything that we were doing was affecting all of this, this huge system. And I think about, you know, the parity wallet thing in particular. And I remember reading on the screenshots of, you know, what was going on afterwards. One of the guys responding to it was sort of shouting at the DevOps guy saying, you know, dude, what are you doing? This is not a game. As he was, you know, going through like killing, killing it. <laughs> um, and, and that really stuck with me of like, yeah, that's something that this space really needs to learn is that when you're dealing with real money, when you're dealing with real people's, you know, savings or accounts or investments or whatever, it's not a game. It's, it's real life. And in particular, I think about the, the exams, the Series 63 exam that you have to take when you go to work on Wall Street. And at the time, it felt like this, you know, sort of total waste of time almost. Specifically, the Series 63 is about ethics. Now, I have a lot of questions about the ability for this exam to successfully weed out bad actors on Wall Street. I think objectively we can see that it hasn't done that. But I do think that the fact that that exam even exists demonstrates something about what it means to work in financial markets. And I think that what it demonstrates is that, yeah, this stuff is important and it's important to consider you know, sort of the, the downstream consequences of all of these actions, whether it's, you know, committing some code or whether it's making a trade. So are you pro-regulation and pro-compliance? I'm definitely not as libertarian as most of the people I find myself working amongst. Um, in, in some ways, I probably am, but in other ways, you know, to be honest, I really believe strongly in consumer protection. Um, and I think that that's something that, probably came in part from my time working on Wall Street, but I think has come in even larger part from, you know, just witnessing the madness, especially of last summer and last fall, when you would just see, you know, whether they were just Reddit trolls or not, people posting on these forums, wait, hang on a second, you know, what do you mean this thing isn't liquid and I can't cash out of it now? People who'd bought into pre-sales of things, uh, you know, with some amount of money that they just should never have been spending. Um, whether it was people posting on these forums, you know, wait, I've lost my private keys. I don't, I don't even understand what these things are. Um, what do you mean I can't access my funds ever again? What do you mean there's no password recovery? And again, maybe some outsized amount of them were Reddit trolls, but there was a lot of desperation in the voices of a lot of these people who just had no idea what they were getting themselves into. And you've definitely seen the same thing in, you know, sort of January, February of this year as the market has taken, taken a turn for the worse of, again, people who've, who seem to have just lost, you know, more money than they even realized was at risk. And don't get me wrong, to a degree, sure, like valuable learning experiences for everyone involved. But on the other hand, you know, these are, as with any financial market, these are complex markets. I don't think it's fair to expect people to understand what they're getting themselves into. And I definitely don't support anyone who is intentionally putting someone in that position, in the position of being the bag holder. Yeah, I um, back in January, I think it was January, I had a Skype call with a uh, lady from New Zealand who contacted me through my Facebook page and her and her husband had invested a small amount into Bitcoin and then suddenly threw $100,000 in and spread it amongst ICOs and various coins and, and dropped down to $20,000. Um, that was their entire savings. Um, and didn't know what the hell to do. Um, which was which was awful for them, and but I'm also then struggled with the whole accredited investor rules because I think they prevent people who are smart enough to invest from investing, and also even though Wall Street can invest, 
the decisions that Wall Street made invest in, um, you know, covered in the big short, which you mentioned, yeah. in the housing market, that affected everyone anyway. So a bunch of people who aren't even investors got, you know, essentially got fucked and lost their jobs because of other decisions. So it seems like whether you're part of it or not, you still have the risk. What do you feel about the incredit- accredited investor kind of rules that, that you must earn over, a, what is it, $200,000 or yeah. and have a million of assets? What do you think of that? No, I mean, it feels very arbitrary, mm. don't get me wrong. And I think that it would be fantastic if there was a way to bring more people into that to, you know, allow people to diversify their investments even into these, uh, you know, more risky, less liquid areas of the market. And I think that like the Jobs Act in the United States, things like Indiegogo and other crowdfunding platforms, I think they've done some interesting work there. Um, I think that it would be great if there was a way to prove some sort of threshold knowledge base, um, you know, be it in investing, portfolio management, and, um, you know, general sort of financial planning, or be it in the specific market of of your choice, uh, to be able to then participate in these things that today are only open to accredited investors. Because I completely agree, it does feel extremely arbitrary. That having been said, I I think that we've also seen, as you mentioned, you know, these cases where people have just lost tons and tons of money that they're now not equipped to deal with. And if there's one thing that drives me crazy, it's the sort of self-congratulatory nature of a lot of the discussion in the space. Not just about, you know, oh, we've all made all this money, you know, well, okay, there are always people on the other side of it, but also... And look at all the good we're doing for the world. We're democratizing the financial system. Well, okay, are you? Or have the rich just continued to get richer here? And maybe some early adopters of Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, in the process. Okay, so we've we've done a good hour already. Um, A couple of things I just want to uh, discuss discuss with you before we finish off. The As you have worked on Wall Street and as you're now in crypto, where do you see the convergence of the two? Yeah, it's it's a tricky question. You know, I touched earlier on Goldman making a play into the crypto space. Um, I think we're definitely going to continue to see the institutionalization of it. You know, I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, some of the big fund managers continuing to offer more and more exposure to it, to their investors. Certainly you have a decent number of traditional hedge funds and other asset managers coming into the space already. I wouldn't be surprised to see that extend even into the mutual fund space. Um, I think that as that continues to happen, you know, what what drives the sell side, what drives banks like Goldman, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley it's whatever their customers want. It's whatever their clients want. And so I think that the buy side will actually be the driver of it. I think that a lot of focus has been put on whatever initiatives are or are not going on, you know, at the likes of Credit Suisse or City or Goldman and so on. Um, But I think that the place to pay attention is actually on, on the asset managers, on the hedge funds and the mutual funds of the world. And do you think most of them are waiting for, or or the biggest block is custody? I think custody is definitely a huge issue. Um, That having been said, I would be surprised if some of these ultra big fund managers didn't have the resources to hire the people who can sort it out and sort it out well. It's definitely a risk vector that they won't be accustomed to dealing with. But you're also talking about people who all they do is they price risk all day. So, you know, there's a right price for everything. There's a discount for everything. I think more likely it's a regulatory game and a compliance game. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of questions that have yet to be answered there around, you know, what what they are and are not going to be comfortable holding and trading in. Right, so they're almost waiting for clarity. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Cool. And then lastly, what's going on with you now? Uh, what's coming up for you next? How should people stay in touch with you? And, and who do you want to hear from? Yeah, 
Uh, thank you. Um, so I am going to be spending the next few months focused on a couple of things in particular. Uh, number one of which is around driving what I view as real adoption of cryptocurrency, which means not just speculative, um, which means for me specifically focusing on areas that it does actually make sense to have an alternative uh, store of value and means of payment. Um, so areas experiencing hyperinflation, experiencing other forms of, call it monetary policy mismanagement. Um, and I'm really excited to be collaborating with a handful of people who I consider really sharp in the space on, on driving that. Um, it's a tall order, but I think that it's something that's not being paid nearly enough attention to right now. So if that's of interest to you, you know, absolutely reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Um, the other thing that I'm going to be spending some time focusing on is the notion of identity. Um, I think that that's something that is is going to need to be figured out regardless of how this whole thing shakes out, regardless of whether it turns out that the only good use case of any of this stuff is store of value means of payment and speculation. We're still going to need some notion of being able, I would love for there to be a notion of being able to do some sort of KYC, AML, et cetera, where it's needed, have sort of an opt-in system that is not just the sort of cumbersome, fully centralized system that we have today. I think projects like Harbor, for instance, mm. are really interesting from that perspective. On the flip side, if it turns out that the sort of Ethereum block stacky vision of a decentralized web comes to fruition, well, you know, I think it's telling that, you know, Tim Berners-Lee has said himself that in the creation of the web, the thing that he sort of forgot or left out was this notion of identity. Um, and I think that things like True Story, uh, the project that um, Preeti Kathreddy is working on, other initiatives in that space, Uport, um, are going to be really interesting. So that's an area that I am going to spend some time learning about and getting educated on. And how do people stay in touch with you? Uh, the best way is to just tweet at me. You'll have to forgive me. I've closed off my Twitter DMs. If you were a woman working in crypto, you would as well. Um, but yeah, tweet at me. Please, for the love of God, don't send me in mail. Um, LinkedIn has, I'm convinced, become the bucket shop of crypto. It's just sort of a wasteland of fraud. So yeah, that's the best way to track me down. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> that was really awesome. Cool. What did you think of that? Did you enjoy it? Did you like listen to what Jill had to say? I definitely would like to have her back on the show in the future. She's got so much knowledge and so much experience. She's so practical. She she looks at the space through a lens that I think is quite missing. You know, she really understands the practical business side of these token based economies or companies, well, you know, whatever you want to call them. But she looks at them quite practically, and she is really considering how this big crypto project's going to pan out. So, yeah, I thought it was great. I really enjoyed it, and I really hope I will get a chance to meet up and talk about this with Jill again in the future. Okay, outside of that, please support the show. As I said in the intro, a review on iTunes would be hugely appreciated. Follow me on any social channel. I'm there at What Bitcoin Did. Feel free to email me. It's hello at whatbitcoindid.com and feel free to check out my open paper project, which is openpaper.io. Okay, I hope you all have a great week. I hope the crypto bear market reverses and I hope we all get back into uh, happy crypto investing days. Okay, I hope you all have a great week. Mm-hmm.